Welcome to Biblical Foundations, a podcast of the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. I'm your co-host, Jimmy Rowe, along with Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. Join us as we discuss issues in biblical scholarship for the church. Uh, Stan and uh, Keith, thank you so much for joining us today on the Biblical Foundations uh, podcast. Uh, Keith, good to see you. And uh, uh, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, your educational background, your doctoral work, and, and also your more recent involvement in global scholarship. Yeah, well, it's always good to see you, Andreas, and to uh-huh. reconnect with you. Thank you for having us on the show. It's a pleasure. Uh, well, I'll start from the end and work backwards. Uh-huh. I did my PhD under you at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in New Testament studies, uh-huh. um, where I focused in uh, the Synoptic Gospels and uh, specifically the influence of the Old Testament lament on, um, on New Testament uh, studies. Prior to that, I did a Master's of Divinity at uh, Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. And uh, prior to that, I did a Bachelor of Arts in Religious Studies at Wingate University. And and now I uh, serve as a Vice President of Program Development at uh, Global Scholars, which is an organization uh, that uh, focuses globally in higher education. Mm-hmm. Based right here in Kansas City. Yes, that's right. The home office is here. We are <laughs> geographically decentralizing very mm-hmm. quickly, but right. uh, this is home for now. Sure. Yeah. Good. And uh, Stan, tell us about your background and, and your uh, work as uh, president and CEO of Global Scholars. Well, thanks, Andres. Thanks uh, so much for inviting me on for the uh, the podcast. So I grew up in a non-Christian home and heard the gospel in high, in high school, came to faith my junior year, and shortly thereafter was up the road going to college at a public university in Ohio, Miami University, mm-hmm. uh, involved in student ministry there and uh, really uh, grew and decided to go on staff with this organization. And uh, uh, after just a very few years in student ministry, I realized that uh, uh, the people on campus who really were influencing the students much more than us or the pastors or anybody else were the professors. Mm-hmm. But nobody seemed to care much about their spiritual lives and whether they were coming to faith and growing as believers. So the uh, Lord led me uh, through an opportunity I had to serve with uh, uh, the faculty ministry of uh, initially Campus Crusade and then after yes. that with InterVarsity's faculty ministry Excellent. and spent 29 years uh engaging Christian professors at public universities to help them mm. uh, be a witness for Christ on campus and, um, mm. and talk with their colleagues who weren't believers about the gospel and integrate their faith into their scholarship. Uh, and then after many, many years of doing that in the U.S., had the opportunity to uh, uh, join Global Scholars to be involved in uh, seeing uh, Christian professors around the world mm-hmm. engage uh, in uh, redemptive ways with their students and colleagues and in their research. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's what I've been doing the last 10 years here, uh, nine, nine and a half years yeah. here. That's great. Well, before we, um, uh, ask you a little bit more about your involvement in global scholarship, I'd be interested too in both of your, uh, academic, uh, backgrounds and, and areas of interest, uh, Stan, uh, uh, still being with you. Tell us about, I think you did some work with JP Moreland and, um, I did. I did. I uh, realized quickly in uh, student ministry, I needed more training to engage the issues that were being raised, both biblically, philosophically, apologetically. So took a master's under J.P. Moreland at Talbot School of Theology mm-hmm. uh, and uh, went on uh, after that to do the doctoral work, uh, ultimately uh, finishing under him mm-hmm. in uh, 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 19... What was that? About 2012, I mm-hmm. guess. Uh, Doctorate of Ministry in Philosophy and Culture, mm-hmm. which has really been helpful to uh, address uh, some of the things we deal with globally and mm-hmm. helping Christian scholars think about their um, their work in the context of the of the broader culture mm-hmm. and, and, and mm-hmm. things that mm-hmm. uh, that can be addressed from a public university's context and yeah. in in those conversations. Yeah, and Keith, uh, of course, um, supervising you, uh, I learned quite a bit about um, lament and mm. and the fact that it 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 some ways seems to be a bit of a neglected field of study. So, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit more about that? Yeah, so so lament studies, um, especially in New Testament studies, was pretty much non-existent, really, mm. and uh, it's so sad because 
at the church level, as a former pastor myself, mm-hmm. uh, not only I've served in academia, but I've served as a pastor for four or five years. And oftentimes, especially when catastrophe happens, tragedy happens, um, there is often too quick of a move among um, among perhaps pastors and sometimes church church members themselves to move too quickly to the trust in the Lord of the mm-hmm. lament, which is beautiful and needed. But um, but the category of lament was was absent uh, mm-hmm. in, in, pragmatically on the ground, but also uh, academically at, at the scholarly level, um, or even intermediately, so to speak. The um, uh, there was take take the churches that tend to be more in the liturgical um, have a liturgical background. The liturgy, for example, would leave out the lament altogether, mm-hmm. just ignore it. And so, I I saw a need for that both pragmatically and, mm-hmm. and scholarly. Where, for example, a funeral, um, uh, say a young child dies, mm-hmm. unfortunately, to give room to ask, mm-hmm. "How long, O Lord? Why, O Lord?" Which at the very heart is the lament is crying mm-hmm. out to God to change a given plight, uh, asking these questions to God that will ultimately turn to trust. But uh, so that was missing, and um, I began to look into the lament in the New Testament. I studied it from a narrative critical perspective. Others mm-hmm. have joined along and have begun to study it even from a theological perspective. And, and the work, I'm glad to say, is ongoing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, a student yeah. at Wingate at uh, Wheaton College is, is looking further into it. So mm-hmm. I was interested in, and still am, the, um, the cry to God to change something that needs to change mm-hmm. and making space for that to happen, um, mm-hmm. both in scholarship and at the local church level, uh, I think is much needed. And furthermore, I think it's needed... Um, not just in the United States, but I think this is one of those beautiful locations, one of these beautiful, a beautiful nexus within mm-hmm. scholarship where there's a need for the Western church to really have an ear and listen to the global, the church in the global South and East, mm-hmm. because I've never really suffered, yes. especially relative to the global church, say in, in Nigeria or mm-hmm. China or North Korea somewhere. And to, to have them speak into this biblically, theologically is needed, and I have a really uh, I have a deep heart for that. Not only with the lament, but more broadly for biblical studies yes. as well. And again, any of our listeners who are interested in your work um, as editor of, of Jets, it's been my privilege, I believe, to publish some of your work both in the area of lament studies and also in the area of, of global scholarship. Yeah, that's right. In fact, um, mm-hmm. you've uh, published. Uh, yeah, some work on where we are in lament studies right. and in encouraging further lament studies, lament and James, if I remember mm-hmm. correctly. Yeah. Uh, what I'm equally excited about was the article uh, entitled The American Evangelical Church and the World, A mm-hmm. Challenge to Practice More Globally. Yes. And uh, especially with in our disciplines at any seminary, Bible college, there are w- when a when a position comes open as you well know, there are um, people lining up hundreds deep, evangelicals, Mm Bible-believing scholars, lining up hundreds deep in the United States to take these positions. Absolutely. And I simply raise the question, and still do, um, is God calling a percentage of those to consider consider practicing their disciplines more globally, Mm -hmm. where the need is large, especially Mm -hmm. with resources, the lacking of resources, and so forth. And so I've you you mm-hmm. did uh, through yeah. Jets publish an article where where yeah. we focused on publishing uh, excuse me doing our research mm-hmm. and teaching more globally. It's true. Uh, sometimes you know I would I would post something on social media, maybe a snippet of, of some maybe a talk I gave or some work I did, and 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 invariably somebody writes in from you know maybe Nigeria or who knows and says we need this here too. <laughs> Uh, yes. and, and and that's a good reminder that we often have you know this this uh, fairly um, imbalanced situation that you and I talked about uh, quite a bit where where um, we've definitely reached a saturation point in many ways here in the United States and and uh, you feel like you know if we're building God's kingdom right we'd want to take our cue as I've Explored in my own dissertation uh, from from the Lord of a Harvest, and then you feel like as He's orchestrating 
the mission of the church, you know, on this earth right now, uh, would he want us to reallocate some resources, you know, to some of those more needy areas? And, and might I might I add there, um, not only a reallocation of resources mm-hmm. that's important. I, I don't know if this statistic is is accurate. I've heard it quoted that mm-hmm. maybe ninety six, ninety seven percent of the world's Christian resources are here in the United States. Not only the reallocation of resources, but the truly global collaboration on resources. Mm-hmm. So it's not just a one way street from the West to the, to the rest of the world. And yes, I think that's important for uh, for Christians mm-hmm. in general, and certainly scholarship more specifically. Oh yeah, and anything we can do here at the Center for Biblical Studies, we're wide open to be partners with you and and you know with with the Lord ultimately uh, in that way because. Um, uh, you know, I'm Austrian background, uh, Jimmy is uh, Korean American, and so we are uh, very much with you in, in, in seeing just an a, a incredible need. Um, with that, Stan, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the, the work of Global Scholars, your involvement in it, um, your vision? Absolutely. So our mission is to equip Christian professors who are teaching in public or secular universities, the private universities worldwide, to have a redemptive influence. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's everything from being able to share the gospel with their students and colleagues to being able to bring biblical truth into their research and publishing and teaching to serving well as Christians in leadership roles in the university, whatever Mm -hmm. that might be. Uh, And uh, ultimately, they're, uh, they're, they're around the world is the same reality. Christian professors in these contexts uh, one, tend not to know one another, so they feel quite isolated. And secondly, mm-hmm. they don't have access to many resources that, uh, that, that, that speak to their needs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so this, the, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Global Scholars seeks to serve them in those two ways. Uh, primarily, and we have gone through a shift in the last year, we historically had been the sending agency, well, we've shifted, and Keith has played a very important leadership role in this, mm-hmm. uh, the key leadership role in this, but we've shifted to become more of a, a, a an equipping ministry that through a new global professional society called the Society of Christian Scholars mm-hmm. seeks to provide a context for Christian scholars around the world to, to, to meet one another, to uh, share resources, to encourage one another, to... Uh, to, to truly be a, a global professional society of, by, and for Christian scholars that we have the privilege of helping provide some of the infrastructure for and to, mm-hmm. and, um, and, and to sort of help it, help it uh, flourish. Yeah. And so your website or any other ways people could get involved? Absolutely. So uh, the Society of Christian Scholars has its own website, which is... Mm-hmm. <laughs> The Society of Christian Scholars dot org, mm-hmm. uh, and so that's a place anybody can go to see what the society is is doing, how it might uh, be helpful to them if they're teaching in in uh, a, a public context or a mm-hmm. private secular context, and join the society. Uh, we have a history website also, which is mm-hmm. global dash scholars dot org, which mm-hmm. was share. Uh, a little bit of the broader context and, and vision beyond just that main program that we have, namely the society. So mm-hmm. those would be the two places I suggest visiting. Wonderful. And so, uh, Keith, you were actually based overseas for several years. Mm-hmm. I seem to remember after uh, your your doctoral work and uh, are still traveling uh, very widely. So you feel uh, free to share a little bit about your your international involvement. Sure. So before becoming one of the vice presidents at Global Scholars and taking a key role in the uh, Society of Christian Scholars, um, I was one of our uh, professors myself uh, in uh, Shanghai, China, Mm -hmm. where I was a visiting lecturer of New Testament and uh, theology at a university there, public university, Mm -hmm. which which was really a, it's really beautifully a God thing because to graduate from, from one of our Baptist seminaries, you... Yeah, you know, I had aspirations to teach in a Bible college or a seminary somewhere overseas, uh, but uh, for the Lord to open the door to teach in a university and to serve there was, um, especially in China, um, mm-hmm. it uh, it was a um, it was a unique opportunity. While in China, taught there for about a four about four years, mm-hmm. um, the Lord opened up wonderful doors to be able to not only share my faith with the beautiful 
people of China, people that I love dearly mm-hmm. and uh, have a deep respect for. I was able to uh, was able to interface with um, future leaders in China. That would be uh, future researchers and future teachers. Everything from from experiencing students uh, coming to faith, but also to see worldviews shift even if they didn't come to faith. So, for example, mm-hmm. the expansion of one key student that was um, that was that I interfaced with quite frequently, uh, he shifted in his worldview from a strict methodological naturalism that says, "Hey, you know, there there is no possibility for the miraculous to take place." Mm-hmm. That he even took the step, and then later would say, um, sure, I, I need to leave room for that as a possibility. And this young student will go on and be a professor in China and mm-hmm. in significant locations. And so so the Lord opened up a door for me to teach in this wonderful country among people that I love and respect dearly and um, and, mm-hmm. and ran into some ch- challenges along the way uh, with the uh, some of the officials in China. Um, and I think it was a bit of a misunderstanding, um, mm-hmm. but... Um, uh, at least I think on the uh, the government of China's part, mm-hmm. uh, it was because of my Christian convictions, and uh, it, it led down to led down some roads of uh, of some um, where where the some of the officials would uh, check mm-hmm. in on my work and mm-hmm. and at the university. But the Lord was faithful in those times yeah. that were challenging yeah. for me, and uh, so I served there for four years. Thoroughly enjoyed it, and loved bringing Christ's flavor into every aspect of university life, teaching, uh, research, and service, and seeing the life of the mind for the glory of God expand within China was a, was a privilege and an honor. Yes, you've always been an example to me, Keith, of, of, of radical discipleship, and I think it's it's important to remember the Lord whom we serve. He, he told us to take up our cross daily and uh, to deny ourselves and uh, to to follow um, him who's rejected by the world, but esteemed by God. And, and so, uh, who knows, there might be some who are listening to this broadcast whose horizons might be expanded beyond just, uh, you know, the predictable and, mm-hmm. and, and, and some of the, maybe the standard, um, you know, roles that we sometimes project for our seminary graduates to, to fill, you know, to see that there's, there's uh, the opportunity for global involvement uh, if we uh, trust him and, and are willing to, you know, as I, Isaiah said, he, as, as said, here I am, send me without um, any strings attached um, to, to allow God to use us strate- strategically anywhere um, to build his kingdom. So thank you very much to, to both of you for joining us on, on the Biblical Foundations broadcast. And, and uh, may God continue to bless you and global scholars in your very strategic work. Uh, what a privilege to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today at Biblical Foundations. For more information, please visit the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern at cbs.mbts.edu. For further resources, please also visit biblicalfoundations.org. Please join us again next time at the Biblical Foundations Podcast.